It was 3 a.m. on a cool and drizzly Monday morning, and the tony town of Cheshire, Connecticut was still sleeping. In the damp darkness, two men were about to break a window as they would shatter the lives of a loving family. As Dr. William Pettit dozed off on his living room sofa, what happened next could never appear in his wildest dreams. In a matter of hours, he would lose nearly everyone and everything he loved in the world. This is the story of the Cheshire home invasion murders as told by one of the killers himself. And this is absolutely criminal. Before the events of one summer morning in 2007, life was good for the Pettit family. William had a successful medical practice. His wife, Jennifer, worked as a nurse at a private boarding school. Older daughter, Haley, played multiple sports in high school and wanted to be a doctor just like her dad. Michaela was a bright student and loved to cook just like her mom. Dr. Pettit met Jennifer Hawk when he was a young resident and she an experienced nurse at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. By the end of his residency there, they would be married and eventually settle in Cheshire to start a family. That house on Sorghum Mill Drive, they thought, would host birthday parties, graduation celebrations, and eventually perhaps weddings and grandchildren. Instead, those walls would bear witness to three shocking and sadistic murders. Haley Pettit was spending time with friends, trying to soak up every last drop of summer before returning to college the next day. The rest of the family went to church. After returning home and changing clothes, Jennifer and her younger daughter Michaela went to their local grocery store. With the girls occupied, William found some free time to play a round of golf on the sunny afternoon. That night, it was Michaela's turn to make the Sunday night family dinner. Each member of the Pettit clan had a busy schedule that pulled them in all directions, but around the dinner table was the one place time halted. No matter what, they were together, suspended in time for the last time. July 23rd, 2007. It was just after 9 a.m. as Jennifer Hawk Pettit walked into a Bank of America branch close to her home in Cheshire, Connecticut. She walked up to the counter, set down her purse, and whispered a desperate plea to the teller. Her family was being held hostage, and she was being forced to withdraw thousands of dollars for her captors. Outside in the family's SUV, waited a menacing Stephen Hayes. He's made it perfectly clear that if Jennifer said one word, he would instruct his partner to execute her family, who are currently under siege in their own home. Hayes's partner in crime was Joshua Komisarjewski. They've been holding Jennifer's family since 3 a.m., when an unlocked basement door provided entry to one of the most callous killers on record. Regarded to be the mastermind of the atrocity, Joshua is a study in contradiction. At one extreme, he's an intelligent, soft-spoken charmer. At the other extreme, however, he is a sadistic sex offender capable of the most deplorable deeds. About seven hours after the deeds were done, Joshua sat down with the Cheshire Police Department still reeking of gasoline. He delivered a detailed and disturbing confession. His versions of events unsurprisingly differ from those of his co-defendant and the police, and would later be disputed in court. The police interview was recorded in audio form only, but painted a vivid picture of the savagery of that night. While absolutely criminal, sarcastic humor may not appeal to some, 
It helps us cope with the brutality in a world broken beyond repair. However, there is nothing funny in the confession you're about to hear. It contains a graphic description of all aspects of the crime, which include a sexual assault on a child. We feel the story can't be told properly without detailing the evil on display that morning, as unsettling as it may be. The recording started, and the detective began to speak. Let's go back to the beginning, and this, this is your statement. So, you stated you had met up with this other fellow. Yeah, uh, Stephen Hayes. Okay. You started to tell us what transpired that you went to stop and shop in Cheshire. That's correct. To meet a contractor. Yeah, to meet a con to receive payment on uh, uh, from a contractor that I've done work for okay. uh, that day. So let's go from there and go over the whole the whole statement that you were going to put in writing. While waiting, I saw a mother and a daughter walk into a school, into uh, the stop and shop. Noticed that they were driving a very nice vehicle. And didn't really think much of it at the time, uh, at which point, uh, about 15 minutes later, the mother came back out uh, with the daughter and got in their car. For whatever reason, I chose to follow the mom and the daughter uh, to their house and saw that they lived in a very nice house uh, with a very nice car. And thought it would be nice to be there someday. Not have to worry about financial problems and stress. From there, we sort of uh, he got into my vehicle and we drove around for a while, trying to come up with ideas of of what we could do to uh, make money and make money quick. Nothing really seemed to to be fast enough um, to meet uh, our looming debts and, and obligations. I had to be called um, that when I had seen this uh, lady driving a very nice car and knew where her very nice house was, and had made mention of that to um, Mr. Hayes and the possibility of them having money in the house uh, might be. Well, fairly decent. Fairly decent might be a good description of Joshua's initial shot of being a good person. His parents, Benedict and Jude Karmasarchevsky, lived in a sprawling 65-acre estate in Cheshire. Built in the 1700s, the homestead was the property of Josh's adoptive grandfather, John Chamberlain. To say Josh was provided ample opportunities would be an understatement. He lived in a nice house and even helped train show horses. Unfortunately, there was another side to his childhood, one marred by molestation and other abuse. It was a complicated co-mingling of factors that helped produce this hell boy. Joshua had been released on parole for burglaries just two months before the events that would make him infamous. In the days leading up to the weekend, he ran into Stephen Hayes at an AA meeting in Hartford. They commiserated with each other about their dire financial situations and expressed a mutual desire to do something, anything about it. Sometime after that 12-stepping, Hayes was thrown out of his mother's house for stealing from her for the umpteenth time. He would go on to rent a cut-rate hotel room where he spent his weekend binge drinking and smoking crack. Now he needed money and was desperate for a place to stay. Joshua met Stephen Hayes in a drug rehab for parolees. Hayes, with his own lengthy criminal history, hit it off with Joshua immediately. An odd couple, to be sure. Joshua could be described as the brains of the duo. He saw himself as some sort of malicious mentor, showing Hayes the ropes in his chosen profession. By the summer of 2007, they had pulled off a few nighttime burglaries together. Joshua was stealthy and silent, and he was sometimes frustrated with his partner's bull-in-a-china-shop persona. 
But now he felt Stephen was ready for the big time. Adrenaline pumped through their veins in the middle of the night as they made their way to the house on Sorghum Mill Drive. They were certain a big score was imminent. So we made our way back, uh, over to the house and parked uh, on their street and around the corner a little ways out of sight and uh, walked down the sidewalk to their house, uh, went around back to see if anyone was awake. At which point we noticed that the father was uh, sleeping downstairs um, in the sunroom, sits in the, the back of the house. Okay. Um, we continued to, to do a walk around of the house, checking windows and doors, uh, all of which were um, locked. And then we went down to the basement, which was unlocked. I opened it and proceeded down the steps. Happened to find a, uh, a baseball bat leaning on the stairs leading up into the kitchen. Um, I took that bat and I went up the stairway. Slowly made my way through the the dinette area um, to the doors um, leading into the, uh, the sunroom with the father they sleeping. Um, at which point I I just stood there um, for a good 15, 20 minutes and I was standing behind him. Um, it's bad. And not wanting to hit him, not, not thinking that I, I, I could. Um, I could see Mr. Hayes in the window uh, motioning to, to strike him and to get it over with, to get it done so that we can move on. And, uh, Did you strike him? I did. Okay. And go ahead and tell us where and how many times you struck this man. Um, I hit him in the head with a baseball bat. He let off this, this unworthy scream. I just kept hitting him until he finally packed up into the corner of the couch and, and quieted down and was just staring at me with wide open eyes. Just sheer confusion. Was he bleeding? Yeah, bleeding yeah, profusely. Dr. William Pettit had been rendered completely defenseless by the blows of that baseball bat. The girls and their mother have slept through the chaos just below them. Before his battered brain could comprehend what was happening, the thieves dragged him down to the basement, bound his hands and feet, and tied him to a pole. At that point, we realized that we had to get the father out of the sunroom um, because it was getting so light, and we didn't want anybody to, to see him. Um, Tied up and put the towel on his head. Right. So you were afraid somebody could see into the house and see yeah. he was hurt or whatever? Yeah, so we uh, untied his feet and uh, we walked over to the basement stairs and made his way down the steps and down into the basement. We were going to have him sit down in the middle area of the basement and lean up against one of the uh, concrete lolly columns. He was uh, a little shaky from uh, what I can only assume was this shock from losing blood. Okay. So I went upstairs and grabbed one of the big uh, cushions off the couch and they got another pillow for his back against the lolly column. Did you tie him back up? Yeah, we, I re retied his feet. Was he assaulted again? He was not. No, he was not assaulted for the rest of the evening. Just uh, that one time. Just the beginning? Okay. This wretched pair of interlopers left him there, helpless, while they headed upstairs toward the women. I mentioned that there were the three women who were upstairs. At which point, Mr. Hayes and I uh, proceeded up the stairway. We passed the first daughter's room on the left hand side and uh, went down the hallway uh, to the master bedroom only to find out that 
uh, one of the youngest owners was had actually fallen asleep with mom watching TV in the master bedroom. So he just put his hand over mom's mouth and shook her gently awake. And then I did, I followed suit with the youngest uh, the daughters. They both had woken up. Um, they were very confused as to what was going on, but very compliant. Um, and told to, to roll over on their stomach, put their hands behind their back. And so we tried to get some deep. And then left the room and proceeded back towards uh, the daughter's room that we had passed. Um, and walked in. And uh, Mr. A stood over uh, the oldest daughter with the handgun and I uh, shook her gently awake. Uh, she was a little, you know, more than a little surprised uh, about what was going on. I explained to her that we weren't in there to hurt her, we were just here for money and that we'd be on our way. When uh, asked to roll over on her stomach, did the friend get her back? She did so. I tied her feet and was very excited again. While Joshua had a charming intellectual side, with Stephen Hayes, well, what you see was pretty much what you got. A below average career criminal, Hayes had never been mistaken for a mastermind. At age 47, he had been a convicted felon for over half his life. His rap sheet contained nearly 60 criminal accounts, including burglary, larceny, drug possession, and forgery. On that fateful night, Stephen persuaded Jennifer to reveal where her jewelry was located. But Joshua wasn't interested in jewelry. He came for cash, and he had devised a plan to get it. So uh, Stephen and I uh, continued looking around for money and realizing that there was no money there. Steve had uh, found a check register the amount of forty something thousand dollars in it and uh, we discussed the possibility of possibly sending um, the mother down to the bank to retrieve fifteen thousand um, dollars the mother agreed and, um, we reassured her that you know there wouldn't be any problems you know, there's something here for the money and be on her way the convicted felons then proceeded up the stairs once more. Each petted girl was taken to her own room where their hands and feet were bound. The invaders tied their wrists to their bedposts. They went from room to room, collected all the cell phones and house phones they could find, and put them out of reach. The sun was beginning to rise, and Joshua knew he needed to move his car away from the petted home. I went back upstairs to check on the two daughters. They're still restrained in the same spot that they were Pretty before you went and moved the cars and whatnot? We had, a, yeah, we had still in their, their beds. Steve went in down to the basement and asked the father what time he needed to be to work and who needed to be called. Um, to be let informed, you know, that he was going to be late. Mm -hmm. I went to the mother and, and asked her how the time she needed to be in to work, and she uh, I replied saying that she was a, uh, a teacher and that uh, she was off in the summer, so it was an issue. The father, on the other hand, is a, a doctor, uh, apparently, and he didn't have to be in the office until 8.30, he needed to make rounds at the hospital around 7, so he was expected to be somewhere around 7. Okay, was that call made? Uh, that call was made. Um, we, Steve and I went upstairs and untied the, the mother from her bed. On the way down, uh, downstairs, um, she had asked if she could uh, peek into uh, both children's uh, rooms uh, to, just to make sure that you know, both daughters are fine. And I was fine with that and it sort of helped reassure uh, KK as well. Um, that was KK. Uh, KK is the youngest daughter, the one that I was spending time talking to. Okay. In the house, conflict began to arise between the pair of thieves turned kidnappers. Time was drawing short, and they had not yet agreed on an exit strategy. 
Steve had come in and uh, had motioned for me to, to follow him into the office um, where the occupants of the house could over here is talking. And said that uh, we were going to need gasoline. Um, and I was surprised um, that gasoline was even a factor in what was going on here. We were just supposed to get the money and get out. And he was going on and on and on about DNA and, and even the drop of spread or uh, a hair falling off your head uh, was enough to, to put us in jail because we were to have our DNA on, on record. Um, he had first mentioned that, um, that we would take the occupants of the home with us uh, in their vehicles. Uh, and leave the house for me uh, their way. Um, he went back downstairs, uh, and I went back into um, AK. About 15 minutes later, Steve came back in motion for me to go back into the office with him. And again, ranting and raving about DNA. And he was mad at me because I had, on several occasions, accidentally used his name in front of uh, the occupants of the house. Um, and but I said, you know, we gotta kill him. You know, we gotta what? We gotta kill. Kill him. Yeah, kill the the, the family and the bird miles down on the top of them. Um, that was that was not a, that was not the plan. I'm not killing anyone. You know, it's just, that's not how it's going down. Like. We were here simply for the money, get in and get out. You know, it's almost 9 o'clock, you know, why, why are you bugging out now? The duo left, Josh in his car and Hayes with Jennifer in the family's SUV. Joshua moved his vehicle down the road and walked back to the house. The rain was steady, and the dark hearts of the two criminals were as menacing as that morning sky. The plan was now in motion and the point of no return had long been crossed. Jennifer was now being forced to drive her SUV. In the passenger seat was Stephen Hayes, the coked-out career criminal, prodding Jennifer on with a gun in her side. They made the short drive to Bank of America, where Hayes warned her that her family's lives were at stake. Any wrong move, and he would instruct Joshua to annihilate her family still clinging to the promise of her family's relief in exchange for the money jennifer exited the vehicle and walked into the bank branch as jennifer stood at the counter she wrote the teller a note explaining her desperate situation as she slipped the note to the teller bank manager mary lyons could tell something was wrong after coming over to read the note she walked discreetly to her office sat down and dialed 911 we have a lady who is in our bank right now who says that her husband and children are being held at their house. Back at the house, Joshua turned his attention to what he'd been thinking about since the grocery store parking lot the day before. KK Rosebud. That's the affectionate nickname Dr. Pettit bestowed upon his youngest daughter. One can only imagine the sheer audacity it took for Joshua to refer to Michaela by the name her father called her. There in her house, invading her space and security. How frightened must an 11-year-old child feel after being separated from her mother, tied to her own bed, and trying her best to make small talk with a psychopath? Unfortunately, things got much worse before the ordeal was over. You're talking to KK about... Just general things. Yeah, just like school and some plans and stuff like that, or what her summer plans are. Obviously, not mine. Right. You know? um, and, you know, one thing led to another, and I ended up having a performing oral sex on I'm KK. You performed oral sex on KK? Okay, okay. Like she wasn't like resisting or anything, so I just kept doing it. And she, uh, I had let her get dressed again, but before she did that, she uh, asked if she could take a shower. Although Joshua claimed he did not force intercourse upon Michaela, 
Both the evidence and his past history would suggest otherwise. The medical examiner found semen. When Joshua was six years old, he was subjected to sexual abuse at the hands of his older foster brother, Scott. Unfortunately, when he became an adult, Joshua chose to continue the cycle of abuse. Did he get the money? He did come home back to the house with the money. Okay. Go ahead. He put the money in the bag. He uh, sort of bluntly ordered me to <laughs> reach high mom. So I tied her feet and her, uh, her hands. Um, he then pulls me to the side. Um, we go into the dining room, which is on the other side of the house. And it says, uh, very matter of fact, they, okay, you're, you're ready. We gotta, we got to kill them and burn the house. I'm like, I'm not killing anyone. We have the money. There, there's not a problem. You know, they've done everything. They don't know who we are. They can't recognize us. It is also going on and on about DNA. If anyone had the most to worry about DNA, it would have been me. Um, but, you know, I wasn't worried about it because she, she had taken a job. Okay. Uh, so I don't know why he was so, like, up in arms about it. Okay. He's like, well then, you know, I'll kill the two daughters and you can kill the mom. I was like, I'm not killing anyone. And we kept going back and forth about it. Okay. And finally he was like, you know what, fuck it, I'll, I'll take care of all three of them. He was in there for, like, it was like 15 minutes, like... Along with the mom. Right? With, with the mom, yeah. And I'm assuming he's just still trying to psych himself up. And um, during which time, I hear this noise down in the basement. And, and suddenly recognized it as the built door <laughs> that led to the outside. Which is where the dad was. Which is right where the dad was. And I yelled and at the same time I jumped up, uh, screaming to see that the father just took off. He just left and um, was racing uh, towards the room that he was in. And uh, he was then coming back towards me. And as we're converging on the, the basement door, um, I could see behind Steve that uh, the mother was um, laying life on the floor uh, with her head on the love seat. Um, and her pants were down and her ankles. Both the Hawk and Pettit families have been extremely critical of the response, or lack thereof, of the Cheshire police on that monstrous morning. Cheshire police have consistently declined to comment on the matter. Uh, I went back upstairs and told Steve that he's gone. We've got to get out of here right now. We have, we have to leave right this second. And Steve's taking all this time you know, to, uh, I don't know what he was thinking. He ends up taking the bag with the money in it and you know, shoving it in my chest and tells me to go start the car. Okay. And I'm like, where's the keys, where's the keys, where's the keys? And he's like, I don't know, they're over there somewhere. And we're going back and forth. And in the middle of that, he darts into the garage. Okay. Um, I turn around to keep looking for these keys, and um, I turn back around, um, and he's pouring a whole bunch of gasoline on the kitchen floor, and down the front hallway, which leads to the stairway. Did he pour gasoline in there where Mom is? And I believe he did. I didn't see him pour gasoline on her, but uh, he uh, there was certainly gasoline there. He then went up the stairs uh, with two bottles. Um, did you follow him upstairs? I, I did. I, I followed him up the stairs because I, I couldn't understand. I, I was like, you can't seriously be, be contemplating burning these, these two girls alive. You can't do that. That's, you just can't. He, he walked out of the master bedroom, walked past me, back downstairs. I went to KK's room. She was still in her bed. I, She's still alive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Face is covered? Uh, yes. The boat case was back door. Um, then I closed the door, and then I went down to the back towards the stairway and passed the 
oldest daughters were, uh, she too was sitting in her room. Um, I tied to her bed. I closed that door and I went downstairs. She's still alive. Absolutely. I can't imagine anyone being burned alive, you know, so I, I thought, I, I fucked up. But, you know, I, I, I get downstairs and, you know, I'm going, I'm, I'm yelling at Steve McGuddy. It's already been five minutes now, you know. I'm confident, you know, there's, you know, an army of police officers right outside the door waiting to open fire at me as I open the door. You're pretty accurate. Bank manager Mary Lyons placed her 911 call at 9.21 a.m. The first mention of the incident on police radios is at 9.26. Two minutes later, a description of Jennifer's car was broadcast along with the license plate number. At 9.32, the first officer arrived at the Pettit House. Seconds later, the shift commander could be heard on the radio ordering officers not to approach the house. At that time, everyone inside the house was alive. Madness. And you know, I keep telling them, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. The entire kitchen just erupts, yeah, in like a sea of flame. I had already had my back turned and I'm running for the door because I knew that the couch that the mom was uh, dead against uh, was doused. So I'm racing out the door and so I race around the corner and I jump into the car, put the key in the and I started up. And uh, just as I started up, Steve comes running out and uh, jumps into the passenger side. And as I throw it in reverse, the vehicle in reverse, I hear a uh, cop siren. And, and I look in my rear view, and there's an unmarked car just pulling up and blocking the, the driveway. Okay. Um, which I proceeded to hit. Now, at this uh, point, is the house fully on fire? Can you tell if the house is on fire? I've wasn't even looking. You didn't know at this point. So you back up, you hit the, you hit the unmarked, you're trying to flee. Um, I got hung up in, in some bushes and I was trying to put it in drive and for whatever reason I just wasn't happening. Like I couldn't figure out how to drive anymore. Like I was just panic stricken. And Steve grabs the, uh, the shifter and goes in drive and yells, pass it. And, uh, which I did. And, uh, took off off the curb and onto the street, and uh, and I'm looking as it's, it happens in like slow mo. As I'm looking around, there's cops everywhere, and every single gun is like trained like right at my head. And I was like, I'm gonna die today. And they, they're going, to, I'm going to prison for the rest of my life, or I'm gonna die. I, I come around like this little bend uh, the road, and there's two. Um, Cheshire police cars, uh, and then in the center of that, uh, an officer uh, with a rifle uh, trained right on me, and then some other uh, officers off to the side. Did you try to run them over? Um, I wasn't trying to specifically run him over. I was trying to get you through. You were oh, I wasn't stopping. I, was, I, I had to get through those police cars. There was no other way out. Um, the airbags deployed. I... All I could hear in like this distant echo was uh, hands out of the car, um, get out of the car, hands out of the car, come out slowly. Did you say anything to the police officers? Um, there were a lot of questions being thrown at me. I was still like, uh, you know, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? He asked um, how many people are in the house or something to that effect, and I said. Uh, two girls in the upstairs bedroom, uh, front-facing bedrooms, uh, and that they were still alive. While police cruisers gathered outside, Jennifer Hawk Pettit was raped and strangled to death by Stephen Hayes. As officers set up a perimeter, Haley and Michaela, still tied to their beds, were doused with gasoline. As cops followed protocol, a match was struck and the die was cast. Police radios crackled to life. The Pettit girls gasped and coughed. Commanders ordered the SWAT team. Dr. Pettit escaped the basement. 